Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, for the record again, Kellen Wright, staff to the Local Government Committee. The bill before you is House Bill 1628, increasing the supply of affordable housing by modifying the sale of state and local real estate excise tax. First, some background on real estate excise taxes. Excise taxes are taxes imposed on specific goods or activities. Real estate is subject to an excise tax uh, imposed by the state and to taxes imposed by cities and counties. The state imposes a graduated real estate excise tax, or REIT, on the sale of property that is not timberland or agricultural land. The top rate, the top bracket, is uh, taxed at a rate of 3%, and this applies to any portion of the selling price that is over $3,025,000. The Department of Revenue adjusts these thresholds every four years. This is done by adjusting the first price threshold by the lesser of the growth in the consumer price index for shelter, or 5%, rounded to the nearest $1,000. Once an increase in the first threshold is determined, each other threshold is increased by an identical amount. The first update to the price thresholds occurred on January 1st of this year. It resulted in an increase of 5% to the first price threshold because 5% was less than the increase in the CPI for shelter. And this increased the first threshold by $25,000. And then each other threshold was changed by the same amount, resulting in an increase of $25,000 across each threshold. That's why, for example, it's $3,025,000 rather than just $3 million at the top bracket. As I mentioned, timberland and agricultural land is not subject to this graduated tax and instead is taxed at a flat rate of 1.28% of the selling price. Until June 30th, 2023, revenue from the state real estate excise tax is deposited as follows. 1.7% into the public works assist assistance account, which is used to make loans and grants to local governments for public works projects. 1.4% into the city-county assistance account, which provides funding to counties and cities based on their size and on how their property and tax revenue compare to the statewide average. 79.4% to the state general fund. And 17.5% to the education legacy trust account, which is used to support education. After July 1st of this year, the portion going to the public works assistance account increases by 3.5%, while that going to the education legacy trust fund decreases by 3.5%. Counties and cities, uh, which I'll call local governments, are author also authorized to impose REITs. Uh, there are five types of real estate excise taxes that counties are authorized to impose, and three of these can also be imposed by cities. First, any local government can impose a real estate excise tax of up to one quarter of 1% of the selling price. This tax is imposed by the legislative authority of the local government. Generally, this revenue can be used for capital facilities with some limitations depending on the size of the jurisdiction and whether it plans under the Growth Management Act. Local governments can also use some of the revenue for maintenance and support of capital projects under certain conditions. The second local government real estate excise tax can only be imposed by local governments that are planning under the Growth Management Act. This tax can be imposed legislatively if the local government is required by statute to plan under the Growth Management Act, as 18 counties are, and the tax can be imposed on, uh, by public vote if instead the county has chosen to plant, plan under the Growth Management Act as 10 counties have. This tax can also be imposed at a rate of, of up to one quarter of 1% of the selling price. The, uh, the revenue from these taxes, uh, from this tax, can be used for financing certain capital infrastructure projects identified in the capital facilities element of the comprehensive plan, for parks, and until January 1st, 2026, and under certain conditions, for facilities for those experiencing homelessness and for affordable housing projects. If certain conditions are met, some of this revenue can also be used for maintenance of existing capital infrastructure projects and for capital projects for which the first quarter percent REIT could also be used. Uh, the final three local government real estate excise taxes are not widely used, so I'm just, I'll cover them very briefly. One is a 0.5% real estate excise tax that can be imposed if the local government does not impose a 0.5% uh, sales tax. Nearly all local governments have opted, opted to impose the sales tax. I believe there's only one city that imposes the 0.5% real estate excise tax. The final two uh, real estate excise taxes are only available to counties. One is a voter approved 1% real, uh, real estate excise tax for conservation areas. And the final tax is a voter approved uh, half a percent real estate excise tax for affordable housing. Only San Juan County has imposed these final two real estate excise taxes, and in fact no county other than San Juan is eligible to impose the affordable housing real estate excise tax. 
because the statute that authorizes the imposition of that tax requires that the full conservation area real estate excise tax must have been imposed by 2003 in order for the county to impose the additional tax and only San Juan County met the deadline. Uh, some transfers of property are also uh, are exempted from being considered a sale. Because these transfers are not considered sales, they're not subject to real estate excise taxation. These exemptions include, among other things, transfers made by gift or through inheritance, transfers made pursuant to a dissolution of, dissolution of marriage, or the transfer of mortgage interest in property. All right, now that uh, covers the real estate excise tax. Uh, generally, I'd just like to briefly also touch on some of the accounts that are referenced in the bill. Uh, the, the bill talks about the Washington Housing Trust Fund. This is used to provide grants and loans for house, housing assistance projects. It will provide housing to those with special needs and those with incomes at or below 50% of the median area family income. It's administered by the Department of Commerce. The Apple Health and Homes accounts is also administered by the Department of Commerce. It is used to support permanent supportive housing programs. And the Affordable Housing for All account is used to fund affordable housing programs. Turning now to this bill, it would add a new threshold, new top threshold for state real estate excise tax beginning in 2025. The new threshold would apply a tax of 4% to that portion of the selling price that is over $5 million. The increased revenue from this portion of the state real estate excise tax over what would have been collected without the new price threshold would be deposited as follows. 30% would go to the Washington State Housing Trust Fund, 30% to the Al Apple Health and Homes account, 15% to a new Developmental uh, Disabilities Trust account, our uh, homes, uh, homes and Services account, and 25% to the Affordable Housing for All account. The Developmental Disabilities Housing and Services account could be used to provide grants and forgivable loans to housing programs to support people with developmental disabilities. The bill also authorizes the legislative authority of a local government, beginning on January 1st of next year, to impose an additional real estate excise tax at a rate of up to one quarter of 1%. At least half of the revenue from the tax must be used for the construction or acquisition of affordable housing, and any remainder may be used for operations, maintenance, and services related to affordable housing. Uh, the expiration date of January 1st, 2026 for the use of revenue from the second of the quarter percent local government real estate excise taxes. Um, the ability to use that for those experiencing homelessness or affordable housing projects, that uh, dead, the expiration date would be removed, so those would be able to be used for those projects indefinitely. Also, the uses that the first and second uh, quarter percent local government real estate excise taxes can be put to are generally unified in the bill or in the substitute version of the bill so that each can be used for the same purposes generally as the other can be. Um, also, the requirement that a local government that chooses to plan under the GMA receive voter approval to impose the second quarter percent real estate excise tax would be removed. Instead, the substitute bill would allow this REIT to be imposed with councilmatic authority uh, by all local governments planning under the GMA, rather than just those they're required to. Finally, beginning on January 1st of next year, the sale of any portion of an affordable housing development by a qualified entity to an organization that meets the requirements for a property tax exemption as a nonprofit organization, housing authority, or public corporation um, for use as a community purpose is, would be exempt from real estate excise taxation. That concludes my presentation on the policy. Uh, sorry it was so lengthy, and I'll now turn it over to Tracy for the financial impacts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there is a uh, fiscal note in EBB on the sub substitute bill. The, uh, the fiscal note shows a reduction of $4,000 for fiscal year 2024. Um, to the state general fund as a result of the um, imposition uh, or creation of the new exemption. Um, as, as the new uh, tier of uh, the, re the state REIT doesn't take effect until uh, later than the, the imposition of the exemption. In fiscal year 2025, there would be a net increase to the um, state near general fund of $40.6 million with um, about $12.2 million going to Apple Home Health and Homes and uh, the Washington State Trust Fund, $6.1 million going to the new uh, newly created account for uh, the persons with disabilities and $10.2 million going to the Affordable Housing for All account. Um, in 2025, the state would see an increase 
of revenues uh, amongst these accounts of a total of 629.26 million. And then 2729, it would be 843.048 million. Um, in addition, the uh, local revenues are estimated to increase by approximately 30.1 million in the first three months of impacted collections for 2024 and by 1.94, I'm sorry, 194.5 million in fiscal year 2025, the first full year of impacted collections. The department would incur costs of approximately $700,000 in fiscal year 2024 and Six hundred and thirty-one thousand for fiscal year twenty twenty-five. Ongoing costs for the subsequent biennium is nine hundred ninety-two thousand dollars. That concludes my remarks. Thank you so much for that, both Tracy and Kellen. That was very thorough. Any questions for our staff? Okay, seeing none. Representative Chop. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair Berg and Ranking Member Orcutt and members of the committee. I'm here in support of this legislation, the Affordable Homes Act. Across our state, there is a housing crisis. Housing is a top priority of the people of Washington. It is rightly a top priority for the legislature and for the people's house. There is a tremendous shortage of affordable housing. The greatest need is for homes for people with low incomes. As you consider this proposal, please keep in mind the people we have a responsibility to help in this crisis. The low wage workers who can't afford increasing rents are forced to live far from their work. The homeless who are suffering and dying on our streets, in our parks, and under our highway overpasses. The people who are developmentally disabled, who are transitioning from the state institutions to homes in our communities. The people among us with mental illness who are desperate to have decent supportive housing with treatment services to ensure their stability. The solution to these challenges is to expand the supply of housing through investment in our people. I urge you to support the Affordable Homes Act. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there, are there any questions for our prime sponsor? Seeing none, Vice Chair Street. We will start with the remote testimony from Mayor Pauley, Council Member Zahn, Council Member Curtis, and Mayor Bernie. And keeping mindful of the clock, I'm going to set the timer at one minute. That set of testifiers will be followed by in person testimony of Greg Hanan, Denny Ellison, and Mike Ennis. Great. So uh, I think I'm up first. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Berg. So good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Mary Lou Pauley, the Mayor of the City of Issaquah, and I'm here today to testify in support of Bill 1628. I really appreciate all of the comments that Representative Chop made. One of our city's top priorities this session is to support policies that provide communities with resources and tools to address their unique housing availability and affordability challenges, and House Bill 1628 does just that. According to draft estimates developed by Commerce uh, uh, doing um, projected housing needs, by 2050, Issaquah will need at least 736 additional housing units at 0 to 30 percent AMI and another 736 at 30 to 50 percent AMI, and 1,500 at 50 to 80 percent AMI. That's nearly 3,000 new units uh, below 80% AMI. What we know in the past is that there is a funding gap and we need to find tools to fill that funding gap. So our housing crisis is complex and requires the legislature to address it from several angles. Um, for years, the legislature has been considering preempting local land use and planning authority when it comes to the middle housing types. Um, I'm hoping that as you consider this bill that you will also not advance the middle housing bill without also advancing bill 1628. We really believe that this is a, a tool that we will all be able to use. And thank you, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Um, at this point, we will move to Council Member Zahn. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair and Honorable Members of the Committee. My name for the record is Janice Zahn. I'm a Council Member in the City of Bellevue. And I'm here also to speak in support of House Bill 1628 along with my other East King County cities. As Bellevue continues to grow, we lack sufficient affordable housing options for people who want to call Bellevue home. It is, as Representative Chop said, a crisis and we need tools just like this. Our high property values in our city make providing affordable housing very, very challenging. 
This is why affordable housing is one of Bellevue's top legislative priorities and has continued to be. Half of the revenues generated under this bill would be dedicated to construction or acquisition of new units of affordable housing and facilities. This is a game changer. Likewise, the flexibility to focus remaining revenue on operations, maintenance and services tied to permanent affordable housing is key. State investment is critical to make progress. Bellevue's at the table, but we can't do it alone. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Council Member Curtis. Madam Chair, it looks like she's muted. Apologies. Thank you for hearing HB 1628 this morning. I am Councilmember Kelly Curtis of the City of Kirkland. And on behalf of the City of Kirkland, we support HB 1628 and thank Representative Chop for sponsoring. The short-term flexibility that the legislature has offered in REIT 1 and 2 has allowed Kirkland to make substantial investments in local projects to provide hundreds of new and renovated units to low-income community members. Every assessment of Washington State's housing crisis has concluded that we will not solve our problem without substantial new public funding to support every city and county to build more affordable housing. The timing could not be more urgent to establish a dedicated revenue source. A new REIT 3 would be a huge down payment for building that housing. Estimates are that a local REIT option 3 would generate over $350 million each year for local jurisdictions, including over 400 or $150 million for King County and the cities within. We need this tool. REIT 3 would generate around $6 million per year for low-income housing in Kirkland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we will transition to in-person testimony from Greg Hanan, Denny Ellison, and Mike Ennis. I am sorry. They will join us in person, and we will first go to Mayor Bernie before going to in-person testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Berg and committee members. I'm Angela Bernie, Mayor of the City of Redmond, testifying today in support of House Bill 1628. Our state needs increased investment in housing, and that investment will not occur without bold action, like the real estate excise tax increases proposed in House Bill 1628. If the City of Redmond were to utilize the local option provided in this bill, it would generate $5 million annually for affordable housing. Redmond needs almost 18,000 new affordable units to meet growth targets over the next 20 years, many of which will not be funded by the private market. The impact of this additional $5 million investment to low-income housing will provide some additional housing security to the households who most need help. This is good tax policy to counter our regressive tax system and much-needed and worthy investments. I encourage you to advance the bill out of committee before the end of the week. Week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. You guys can go in whatever order you'd like. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Greg Hannon, representing NAOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association, and speaking in opposition to House Bill 1628. Increasing the REIT will exacerbate housing scarcity and challenge efforts to revitalize our downtowns. The 2019 REIT increase is already a major factor in how investments are made in this region, raising it even further at a time when property values are dropping, interest rates are climbing, and the post-COVID realities of work from home or decreasing demand for office space will take many would-be sales uh, off the table and depress multifamily housing starts in Washington. Just last week, we all heard the announcement that a major Seattle employer expects employees to be back in the office in May. However, the rest of the story is that is only for three days a week. We are in a seismic shift over how the existing built environment will be utilized in the future. State REIT collections are down almost 10% lower than forecasted. The December REIT collections for property sales over $10 million were $1.4 billion in December, yet in January that fell to $209 million, an 85% reduction. And it's well documented that the city of Seattle's current budget deficit is directly attributable to a decline in REIT collections. I had more information on the what I believe are the unintended consequences on multifamily properties of the 2019 increase. I sent that information to you, and I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Denny Eliason, here on behalf of the Washington Realtors Association. We appreciate the opportunity to testify in respectful opposition to House Bill 1628. 
In 2019, lawmakers asked our association to join with you to consider transitioning the REIT uh, to where it would be levied on a graduated basis and in the process bring additional funding, uh, both to the State General Fund and to many programs that were focused on affordable housing. While the realtors had, had historically resisted increasing the REIT in an effort to keep housing more affordable at all levels, we did in indeed join with lawmakers in this effort. And now we enter into the mixed House Bill 1628, which comes at a time when we see a slowing in our economy and a softening in real estate sales, particularly in the commercial and multifamily sectors. At a time when we are all trying to find housing solutions to make housing more available and indeed affordable, we don't believe it is appropriate to add yet another significant new tax on real estate. For those reasons, we respectfully ask that you consider opposition of House Bill 1628. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, I'm Mike Innes here on behalf of the Association of Washington Business. We are also opposed to this bill. House Bill 1628 will increase the cost of housing across the state. The fiscal note shows this bill will raise the cost of housing and commercial properties by about $260 million in the current biennium. 1.1 billion in the 2025 biennium and 1.4 billion in the 2027 biennium. House Bill 1628 would place Washington State with the highest combined state and local REIT tax in the country. Even with the $5 million floor, this bill would impact renters in multifamily units as well. A modest 20 unit apartment complex that sells for six and a half million would see an increase of about $5,200 per unit. Most, if not all, that cost would certainly be passed on the tenants in the form of higher rents. We cannot continue adding to the cost of housing and expect our affordability crisis to get better. We urge you not to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. Our next test to hire will Actually, be... Oops, sorry, hold that thought. <laughs> sorry, I'm going like too fast for my own good. Uh, Representative Barnard. Thank you, Chair Berg. Uh, quick question for, for any one of you. So this bill, the way it's written, would that, who would that uh, disproportionately affect uh, just in terms of, of access to housing? Thank you. Yeah, there's two components. The, the first component is the increase in the state rate on sales over uh, five million dollars. It's an additional one percent. That is going to primarily impact commercial properties and multifamily properties. And my point that I would have liked to have made is that the impact of the REIT on multifamily properties is two to three times a, com a comparable single-family home. So we're uh, having the impact is on those multifamily properties and those dwelling units that we need to create. Secondly, the local REIT in about $450 million in the fiscal note for the 2025-2027 period of time is on the whole gamut of the REIT collections and a portion of that, I'm not sure how much, is on housing as well. What, what I'm most concerned about is those that are maybe disproportionately affected as far as uh, lower income if they're trying to get into their very first home. Um, is the goal to um, well? Could you could you comment on on that? Uh, maybe a, a BIPOC community, um, how, how this may affect them as far as their ability to purchase their first home. Yeah, it, it will be important to see how this um, proposal breaks out across the various uh, types of housing and commercial properties. And I don't have that information. I hope we can develop that information through the committee staff. Um, but it's clear that the, what we have to do in our dense urban environments is provide more housing. Most of the time that is through multifamily housing. This has a very disproportionate effect on the ability to create multifamily housing and make those investments. It also has a disproportionate effect on the on transactions that occur with multifamily properties in that the REIT would be embedded into the multifamily property on subsequent sales. Just a quick example. A uh, 20 unit, $10 million property, plus or minus, uh, the REIT would be about $20,000 per unit on a comparable single family home, um, $500,000 equivalent, the REIT would be plus or minus $5,000. So in that case, two to three times more. 
Yes. And just to clarify, so the question just around the um, BIPOC community, was that kind of part of it, just marginalized communities and their ability to purchase? So just so just the levels that I always, it always gets my um, antennas up. Um, you know, we're talking about just basic home ownership and different, differing views on what allows for accessibility to home ownership. Um, but I also want to make super clear within our BIPOC community, um, we're all not marginalized. It's not, it's, you know, it's functionally, it's a, there's two separate questions, socioeconomic marginalization versus racial marginalization. And occasionally the intersections do twine and, and often they don't. So just making sure that we're clearing find that for the folks listening at home. So, but thank you for your question. And thank you for your answer, Greg. Uh, Vice Chair Street. So our next thus far will be in person, Council Member Baker, and then Council Member Hines, who is remote. They will be followed by uh, Jeff Pack, who I believe is in person, and then Tim Iman and David Baker, who are remote. Go Good morning, Chair Reed and members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Baker. I'm a member of the uh, Kenmore City Council, and I'm testifying in support of uh, House Bill 1628. Because my time is brief, I won't go into detail about why this legislation is desperately needed, and instead I'll highlight one amendment that we flagged for the bill sponsor. We are requesting that local governments be given the option to implement the new REIT only on a portion of the sale price. If given this option, the city of Kenmore would choose to exempt the sale of properties below 500,000 from the third quarter REIT. This option will allow cities to keep affordable housing affordable and makes the REIT more progressive. Uh, the state has placed increased responsibility on cities to plan for greater affordable housing needs. And to do this, local jurisdictions must have meaningful resources at their disposal. While any new revenue source comes with impacts, we feel a REIT minimizes impacts on residents and businesses compared to other possible funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Hines. All right. Uh, Chair Berg, Ranking Member Orcutt, and committee members, I'm John Hines. I'm from the Tacoma City Council test diet, testifying today in support of House Bill 1628. As was said earlier in the meeting, communities across Washington State are experiencing a housing crisis. This bill recognizes that addressing this crisis requires all of us to work together as partners to find a solution. House Bill 1628 raises revenues at the state level and provides a tool for a local option. As this bill advances, I'd urge you to keep both state and local components of the bill intact. As background, prior to COVID-19, 33,000 households in Tacoma were cost burdened, which means they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. This is 40% of the city of Tacoma, the third largest city in the state of Washington. Tacoma has adopted a Tacoma housing Formal, formal affordable housing action strategy to address the housing crisis on multiple levels, including removing barriers to build more housing in our city more quickly. The affordable housing action strategy also outlines that to take action on the strategy, we need more funding. Uh, the strategy specifically calls out the request requesting the state legislature to approve a new local option for the real estate excise tax to fund our affordable housing action strategy. And I would note that San Juan County already currently has this ability. So please consider allowing the rest of the state to join. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. We will now hear from Tim Iman, then David Baker, and then Jeff Pack online. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Tim Iman from Bellevue. Uh, over the last 10 years, Olympia has raised taxes 41 times. That's going to bring in $62.3 billion over the next 10 years. It's insatiable tax appetite. It's just really hard for taxpayers to swallow that the problem is that you're not taking enough from us. Now this new bill radically increases property taxes that makes housing less affordable in order to pay for more affordable housing. It's just completely backwards. It's upside down. It's like Alice in Wonderland where up and down and down is up. It's just extremely frustrating that we're ignored on our $30 tabs because the legislature said we were confused and we're sitting here looking at a massive tax increase in property taxes supposedly to make housing more affordable it doesn't work it doesn't make sense you've already raised taxes 41 times in 10 years that's enough you shouldn't overburden the taxpayers anymore thank you thank you so much go ahead jeff
Jeff, you're muted. Oops, there we go. Thank you. My, my name is Jeff Pack, and I represent Washington Citizens <clears throat> Against Unfair Taxes, 3,000 plus very unhappy taxpayers. I'm here in violent opposition to this bill. You taxocrats in Olympia really like to play up class warfare, those evil rich people. You've stuck it to them with an unconstitutional capital gains tax, taken away their $30 tabs, and now we'll stick it to them with higher excise taxes too and more local taxes. Where you folks continually miss the boat is the impacts of your decisions. You raise these taxes without ever looking at or even understanding the impacts. You think a rental owner is gonna eat that one to 4%? No. Beware the law of unintended consequences, but you really don't care because it's all about your agenda. By the way, apparently I'm considered rich now too, and you're taking away money from my retirement. So please pat yourselves on the back. You stuck it to those evil rich people again. I'd like to leave you with a quote. Why is it considered greed to want to keep the money you've earned, but not greed to want to keep Excuse me, but not greed to want to take away somebody else's money. Think about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. The next panel will be remote, uh, consisting of Patience Malaba, Chris Person, Ryan Donahue, and Chad Vacolin. Go ahead, Patience. If you want to turn on your camera and perfect. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Berg, members of the committee. I am Patience Malaba, the Executive Director of the Housing Development Consortium, testifying in strong support of House Bill 1628, a bill that will expand the supply of affordable housing through critically needed investments. Let me remind all of us this morning that housing affordability is at a crisis level in our state and it will take all of us coming together to act at the scale we desperately need. Our fundamental problem is we lack housing supply and we have been woefully, woefully behind in adequately investing in housing for our community. And today, as a result, we need a million more homes over the next 20 years and the market cannot deliver on those homes on its own. We will need public funding to make that possible. And with House Bill 28, we're creating a revenue source that will help do that. And we have declared 2023 the year of housing. In practice, that means passing bills that meaningfully address the social needs of our time and narrow the inequity divide by investing at scale in affordable housing. We're counting on you to lead and deliver, and we're grateful for all of the work you're doing. Please support House Bill 1628. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, thank you. My name is Chris Persons. I'm the CEO of Community Roots Housing, a Washington State public corporation. As a representative of a PDA, I can't speak for or against legislation. What I can say is that Community Roots Housing has been doing this work, developing affordable housing for over 40 years, and we have a very successful track record doing it. There's no magic to it. Affordable housing development is complicated and expensive. It takes a lot of money. Market rate development does not create affordable housing because low income and no income people cannot pay enough rent to support their uh, return on investment. Increased costs won't increase rents because market rate developers charge the maximum rent the market will bear regardless of cost. It takes public subsidy to meet the enormous need and move projects forward quickly. More public subsidy means more affordable housing. I said affordable housing development is not magic, but the impact of affordable housing is magical, providing opportunities for families and individuals to thrive and succeed, improving health outcomes, education outcomes, and leveling the playing field equitably for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Hello, Chair Berg, Ranking Member Orcutt, and members of the committee. My name is Ryan Donahue, and I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer for Habitat for Humanity, Seattle King, and Kittitas Counties. And I'm here in strong support of HB 1628, the American Homes Act. There are two major hurdles that we need to get over this year if we want to make a dent in the affordable housing crisis. Comprehensive zoning law changes and funding. This is one of the few bills this year that actually gets to the funding side of that equation. 
The funding is often what makes the difference between a project getting built and a project having to be abandoned. It's what makes uh, what makes affordable housing and home ownership units pencil out and what puts parent families in homes. Uh, we at Habitat for Humanity have been helping, helping families find affordable home ownership opportunities for 37 years. Families like Aurora and her daughter, who are now in a Habitat home near where she grew up. Families like Lachelle and her children. Someone who's been here in Seattle for generations and has been pushed out of her old neighborhood due to displacement. The dollars that this act will generate are the difference between people like Lachelle and Aurora being able to build roots in this community and forcing them to stay or forcing them to stay as renters in substandard cramped apartments. Please pass this bill. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Chad. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chad Vaculin with the Eastside Affordable Housing Coalition, speaking in support of HB uh, 1628. I'm here to urge action on the growing housing affordability crisis that is causing homelessness and displacing individuals and families throughout the state. Commerce data projects that Washington will require an additional 1 million homes by 2044, with the overwhelming majority designated for low-income people. It's really crucial to understand that the private market does not sufficiently build housing for low-income populations and production of this housing um, really requires a public sus subsidy to make it possible. This is why we need a multi-pronged funding approach from all levels of government to meaningfully address the crisis. These funds can be leveraged with other local, state, federal, and private investment um, to attract more affordable housing projects in the community. And as we all know, housing is essential to stabilize families, improve health, and attract investment into communities. I implore you to support this bill and take action into the growing housing affordability crisis. And it will really take all of us coming together to act at the scale that we need. So thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. Next, we will hear from Kevin Wallace and Jody Alberts. They will be followed by Michelle Thomas, Sol Villarreal, and Elizabeth Chamberlain. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. So I'm Kevin Wallace, Wallace Properties, and we build transit-oriented affordable projects, workforce housing projects, using private sector money and usually the multifamily tax exemption. And I'm here to ask you to um, not move forward with this bill because what it's doing, we, you know, I support the, the goals of the funding, but it's the source of the funding that's the problem. And the compounding effect we have right now from the increased government regulations is driving the cost of producing these projects so high that they just don't pencil. So the outcome of adding yet another layer of expense onto the whole investment paradigm is going to be fewer projects getting built. You know, patients talked about the need for a million new homes. The only way you're going to be able to do that is to engage the private sector to produce those homes and making us the highest real estate excise tax in the country is not going to pr produce that. I also ask you to take a look at the comp compound effect of this with the federal capital gains tax because it's really um, causing sales not to occur and it'll cause more conversions to condos. So I hope you'll think about these details as you move to consider moving forward and, and ultimately conclude not to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Jody. Thank you, Ms. Chair, and uh, good morning, committee members. My name is Jody Alberts, and I direct government affairs for the Bellevue Chamber of Commerce. And today I'm testifying in opposition of Bill 1628 due to the negative impacts this legislation would have on businesses, consumers, and the real estate market as a whole. As you're aware, um, as already been mentioned, Washington currently already has one of the highest state excise tax rates in the country. Washington is also one of the few states with an additional local option real estate excise or transfer taxes. The majority of properties that are sold that are valued over uh, $5 million are often multi-unit housing, apartments, duplexes, retail, and commercial properties, which provide homes, products, and serv services for every Washington resident. These are all things we desperately need to spur the development of, um, including middle housing and transit-oriented development to sustainably reach achieve our housing goals. And while the intended effect of this bill is to reduce the cost of um, housing, it will cause the opposite. The additional tax will be passed on to the home purchasers and renters through increased home prices and rents. 
um, additionally taxing an industry that as a state we want to incentivize and further flourish um, will exacerbate the issue at hand. In fact, this does the opposite by disincentivizing a transaction that has higher risk, specifically in this current economic climate. Thank you. Again, so much. I urge you to pose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Michelle. Hey, I'm Michelle Thomas with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance Pro and House Bill 1628. Washington needs a multi pronged approach to solve our affordable housing crisis, and that includes a dedicated fund source for the Housing Trust Fund and more local options. The time for this bill is now. The capital budget alone cannot invest enough to solve the crisis. A dedicated fund source will both guarantee a minimum funding amount for affordable housing and will allow our local communities to plan. But right now, all we can do is react to what the legislature decides to do with each capital budget. And more local options are needed to complement and leverage state and federal local uh, state and federal investments. Local options solidify local stakeholders and create strong needed partnerships. According to recent polling, Washington voters want both the state legislature and our local governments to do more to end the affordable and housing uh, homelessness crisis. This bill answers that call. Lastly, to the comment that landlords will simply pass the cost on to tenants and make housing more expensive um, by increasing rents, the Housing Alliance has carefully tracked rent increases since 2011, and they do not track taxes or even inflation. Instead, as one landlord told a Spokane tenant recently, the rent increase she got was simply what the market will bear. And I'll remind the committee that the premise of the bill is to get people out of unregulated for-profit rental marking and rental housing and into rent-regulated affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Saul. Hi, my name is Saul Villarreal. I'm a residential real estate agent in Seattle, and I'm here to speak in favor of HB 1628. The representative Barnett's question earlier, the REIT is only paid when a seller sells their home. And in my experience with the residential sector, Real estate prices are dictated by what the market will bear, not by what sellers want to charge. I imagine it works the same way in the commercial sector. And while Washington might have a very high REIT, our property tax rate is dramatically lower than most other states. So property owners will still likely have lower costs here than they would in other states for their overall cost of building property and selling it. You've heard a lot about the need for more funding for government subsidized affordable housing. That's very real. Others have spoken to it more eloquently than I can. Adding another REIT tier that only applies to large commercial transactions and very wealthy individuals will help provide some of that money that our poorest community members so desperately need. And I can assure you, if you own a property that's worth $5 million or more, you can afford to pay an extra 1% when you sell it. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. Next, we'll hear from Elizabeth Chamberlain. She will be followed by Elsie Baker, Blaine Brinkley, and Clark Lane. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Berg, Ranking Member Orcutt, and members of the committee. My name is Elizabeth Chamberlain, and I am the City Manager for the City of Walla Walla. I am testifying in support of uh, House Bill 1628. Cities in Eastern Washington struggle with housing and are not immune to the housing crisis facing our state. We continue to work on various solutions to address housing supply and affordability. For example, Walla Walla has been a leader in the state on missing middle housing by eliminating single family zoning in 2018. This bill would permit a third 0.25% of REIT by councilmanic vote and will be another tool in our toolbox to address housing in our communities. The amendment to the bill that passed out of local government would also allow REIT 2 by councilmanic vote for optional planning counties and cities. Walla Walla is one of those original opt-in counties to GMA. Although now 30 years later, there really is no difference. We are a fully planning city. On behalf of the citizens of Walla Walla, the city respectfully asks for your support on House Bill 1628 and the uh, amendments therein. And thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Street. Does not appear like Elsie Baker, Blaine Brinkley, or Clark Lane are online. So we'll move to Scott Livingood, Mark Cote, and Ginger Kwan. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you, Chair Berg and committee members. I'm Scott Leidengood from Alpha Support Living Services, a nonprofit support living provider serving over 200 clients in King, Snohomish, and Spokane, and here in support of 1628. Support Living serves approximately 4,500 individuals with developmental disabilities, most receiving 24-7 in-home supports from over 140 agencies statewide. 
Due to workforce issues and lack of affordable housing, the number of people served in support living has actually decreased by almost 300 people over the last three years. This bill will be, will be a much needed investment as 15% will go to housing for people with developmental disabilities. You see those in support of living pay for rent, utilities, other living expenses on an average monthly income of around $900. With a three person house being the average setting, three clients would only be able to afford about 820 in rent, which is one to 2000 below the fair market rent, depending on the county. In a recent report to the legislature, it showed that less than 3% of clients of DDA live in affordable set aside units from the housing trust fund. We need to lower the barriers. And so we urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we'll hear from Mark Cote. Um, hello, my name is uh, Mark Cody. I am the executive director of Parkview Services, a 501c3 non nonprofit housing developer. I, I live in the 37th and Parkview has offices in the 4th, 32nd and 43rd. Parkview Services has developed 181 affordable housing units for extremely low income people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDDs, in 60 properties around King, Snohomish and Pierce counties. Parkview Services owns and manages the housing it develops. I strongly support HB 1628 and urge you to pass it. The bill does three important things for affordable housing. One, it raises funds that would triple the amount typically available to create the, and sustain affordable housing in uh, for people with IDDs. Two, it establishes that funds awarded to nonprofit developers serving extremely low income people should be structured as recoverable grants, not interest bearing loans. Affordable rents for the population are typically $275 a month. This is less than 30% of the fair market rent. There is simply no practical way to repay a loan. Three, it permits use of funds to develop affordable housing, provide operating and maintenance subsidy, and pre preserve affordable housing. Much needed funds to sustain affordable housing in perpetuity. I urge you to pass Representative Chop's forward-thinking bill that can make real headway to house the 37,000 people with IDDs in Washington that face housing insecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will hear now from Ginger Kwan. Good morning, Chair Berg and members of the committee. My name is Morgan Stark, and I'm reading this statement on behalf of Ginger Kwan, the Executive Director of Open Doors for Multicultural Families, a nonprofit organization serving persons with developmental and intellectual disabilities and their families from diverse communities. I'm testifying today in strong support of House Bill 1628 to support the increase of affordable housing opportunities and related services for people with developmental disabilities. Open Doors for Multicultural Families serves over 1,000 persons with disabilities and their families from the diverse community annually. Not able to find affordable housing and rental assistance are two common challenges the families face regularly. Senior parents whose adult children with developmental disabilities worry about what will happen to their children with disabilities after they are gone. Open Doors did housing assessment done in 2021, about 54% of survey respondents have a household income of less than 35,000 per year, which is approximately the 30% AMI threshold for a family of four in King County. I am joining with my community and urging your support of this bill. So our IDD communities are given opportunities to live in stable housing with needed support and services. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe you stated your name, but could you do that just one more time for the record? Yes, my name is Morgan Stark. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we only have two more testifiers in Suzanne Rohner and Maria Roth. However, there's others signed in. We will move to those two, and if those others show up, we will call them up. Otherwise, we will conclude the hearing then. Okay, this is Suzanne Rohner. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Go for it. I can't seem to get my camera to work, so um, you That's have to fine, look at Suzanne. a blank screen. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to oppose um, House Bill 1628. I am totally for afford affordable ho housing. However, I oppose your method of how you plan to pay for it. What seems to happen is you come up with plans and bills and ideas, and then you say to the, to the community and the people that pay for it, this is how much money I need, rather than saying, this is what we have in money and what projects can we do with that amount of money. In my personal life, if I have a funding gap, I have two choices. I can earn more money, which right now on a fixed income is not possible, or I can spend less. 
And I think maybe you folks ought to look at spending less also. Another concern I have is in the original bill in section six, paragraph four, it's been stricken and it reads um, revenue gener revenues generated by the tax imposed um, in this section. I'm sorry, I'm trying to scroll here. Revenues generated by the tax imposed by this section must be deposited in a separate account after December 31st, 2023. And that's been stricken and it hasn't been replaced with anything. So my concern is where's, where are those revenues going? Are they going in a big slush fund somewhere that can't be monitored? Um, you know, with the fiasco with some of the COVID spending and, and Thank bailouts you. there. I Thank don't you, want Suzanne. That to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Maria, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Madam Berg and committee. I am testifying today as a concerned parent of a child with IDD. I have a son who has autism. And although we have uh, taken the necessary measures to uh, take care of his special needs, I am concerned about housing because housing has been an issue for myself. And although I've been able to navigate the system and provide housing for us, I don't know how that's going to work out for my son when I'm no longer around and what will be available for him. So I am in strong support of Bill 1628 because I know that not only is housing an issue for uh, myself, but it is definitely going to be an issue in the sense that I know that how uh, employment is difficult for autistic adults. Usually there is a 90% unemployment rate and there needs to be safeguards for our- Thank you so our, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone who's testified. Um, I believe we've got to all the testifiers that are both in person.